mark on that. We had a great turnouts for recent talks about the history of the library. It's so great to see you all this afternoon. I will turn things over to Charlie. I, before I turn it over, I wanted to recognize his efforts to do today's program together. Thank you so much to many staff here today. Thank you all for taking the time out of the day to join us. And um, Cecily, thank you for your work that you will all hear about uh, in a few minutes. Thank you again for coming. Charlie McMahon, our adult programs manager. So thank you all for coming out today. I'm just saying it's a night because I'm used to talking about your main programs, but it is the afternoon as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I'm Charlie McMahon, as Stephanie said, I'm the adult programs manager here at the Quad Library. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about what makes the Quad Library so special. Everyone who steps through the stone art in the Quad Library can immediately tell that this is a special place. There's a certain feeling about it, an essence, if you will. The essence was instilled in the very first days in months of our heaven. While we offer so many different services, a circulating collection, a library children's library, and a robust calendar of programming, it's this history that makes us stand out from the crowd. In understanding our needs, greater inherent truths about the library emerge and become clear. Cecily Dyer, our special collections librarian, joined the Quad Library in February 2022. In a short time, Cecily has conducted extensive research that no one in our institution's history has explored for years. She's gone deep into the vaults and found very, very, very interesting personal narratives. She's taken the time to discover fascinating stories about our institution's founders, details that shed a new light and imbue our founders with incredible humanity. Last month, we had the pleasure of hosting a story in West Wales. For his discussion, he explored what makes people on library unique from an architectural perspective. He went into every detail of that. Today, you will hear what makes this space unique from a personal perspective. On a regular basis, people on library will be making a concerted effort to properly explain and contextualize the history of our proud library. While that story is intimately tied to the Marquand Monroe family, thanks to the work of Cecily, we are constantly discovering more and more fascinating areas about the early days. We are able to conduct this important research and present it for free to audiences, thanks in part to contributions and donations from supporters like you. So thank you all so much for your continued help. Without further ado, it is my pleasure to send Cecily Dyer. Thank you all again for coming up. Thank you so much for that kind of introduction. Thank you, Stephanie, and thank you all, uh, our audience, for joining us today. Can everybody hear me okay? Does it sound all right? Mm -hmm. Oh, you check that. Thank you. I don't think I'm a little short of this. <laughs> um, so today's series, uh, Today's lecture was part of the series, the um, Out of the Ball series. And I have indeed brought some materials out from that um, that you can see on our table in the back. Um, but I also want to say that, in fact, it's sort of out of the vaults. There are, um, in order to do this research, I visited a number of repositories to find new stories about Virginia. Um, and so I'll show some of the sources that I looked at. And this research is really the type of research you could do for anyone. I see some people from the genealogy roundtable here today, uh, and this is the type of research that they might do as well. Yeah. Again, I'm excited to see the many people interested in Virginia. Uh, who was already familiar with Virginia? Most people. So uh, Virginia, Mary Virginia Tompkins, Mark Long and Will is our founder. And I will unpack that name and her history a little bit to figure out who she was and uh, learn a little bit more about her time. So I know a number of us, especially from the library, are familiar with her adopted mother and father, uh, whose portraits are behind the screen, Eddie and Sir Lake, uh, Mark Mons. 
Virginia was the daughter of Augustus Bachman Tompkins and Mary Kingfield Tarkins. Mary was the sister of Frederick. And what brings together so many of the people in this story is their connection to the silversmith business. Uh, Isaac, Frederick, and Mary's father was sort of the patriarch of, uh, of the Marquand silversmith business. But in addition to the silversmith trade that they undertook, they were also merchants. So you see not only one of Isaac's pieces that they had a little right, but a notice in the newspaper from one of those ships taking commodities from the South to the North. And that is really how they made up their fortune. Isaac's son is Frederick. That's the portrait there on the right. That may have to the screen, Frederick and Eddie. And I'll say as well that um, from the archives, we have one of their, one of Frederick's letters on the table in the back, as well as one of the spoons that he had. Okay, so I think of them a little bit like uh, Tiffany Silver today. They were more than just hand crafters. They really had a silver empire. Um, so a lot of the silver that they sold was actually imported and bought from under the silver stress. So this is Mary's father, Carrasco's Osborne Hawkins, also a silversmith who joins with the Marquand family. And Virginia's eventual husband's um, uh, Albert Brinkerhoff Minimum. Albert joined the firm as well, and his father, in fact, and the Eastern had also been part of the firm. When Frederick Marquand retired in 1839, the partners to the firm restructured and then the firm went from being called Marquand and Company to Ball Black and Company. And it continues to be known as one of the premier silver houses in the United States. And there's this lovely picture on the lower right of their shop in New York City on Broadway. So just touching back on the family tree again, it's a little bit complicated. There's such a web of connections, both from silver and from uh, the various families. This is a letter that's at the Connecticut Historical Society. Uh, this is from Erastus, Mary's father. Uh, before his marriage, this was written in Brooklyn in October of 1833. And we know at this time that he was part of the, uh, he kind of joins the Mark on foot. Uh, and so he talks in this letter to his grandfather about how hard he's working. He apologizes for not writing sooner, but he said, I work from 7 30 in the morning to eat at 9 or 10 at night. So he's working with the Mark on the family. And soon after, he marries Mary. Brother of Frederick Silversmith and daughter of, of Isaac, so he must have had their approval. He marries Mary, and their daughter, Mary Virginia Tompkins, is her maiden name, is born in Brooklyn in 1837. Um, and a little bit about Brooklyn is are there any Brooklynites here? Anybody who is in Brooklyn? Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, what we're looking at here is um, in the foreground in the center is sort of where South Street Seaport would be. And across the way there you see Brooklyn. And the family lives in Brooklyn. Um, around 1814, the steam ferry had been developed and it absolutely changed the landscape. A lot of people moved out, particularly wealthy merchants like Frederick and Isaac, moved out to Brooklyn and they could commute easily from Brooklyn Heights to Lower Manhattan. Some of the reasons behind this too were um, epidemics, uh, cholera, and you know, fever in the 1830s, very destructive fire. Um, so there were many motivations for people to move out 
tema que me interesa. Bueno, as a young child working in the on pineapple streets. Um, we actually don't have a picture of our house that on um, 65 Pineapple Street would have been just to the left of the Thousand Sphere, where you can see that large brick apartment building. Um, it was torn down before any photographs were taken, but we know that it was a wood frame house and there was a down woods that was his next right there that we see in the photograph. Her grandparents, Isaac and Lucretia Marcano, lived nearby in State Street. And her uncle Henry, who uh, you might have heard of Henry G. Marcano's uh, Cups Towns, the Metropolitan Museum of Art. He was a young man who lived there as well. Mary was born in Virginia, and Virginia was born in Ireland. Just a little more than nine months after her parents were in, um, but within a year, her mother gave this in the death notes from the death In 1838, her mother died of rapid consumption hastened by inflammation of the balance. Consumption was typically uh, what they called tuberculosis. So we don't know how. Her father, Ernest, is now a single father, cared for her for the first year. Uh, the mother was buried in Greenwood Cemetery, and just as an aside, this was the year that Greenwood Cemetery was founded. Don't know if any of you are familiar with it, but I've been there. But it was part of the rural cemetery movement. So the first was Mount Auburn Cemetery in Boston, you might be familiar with. Uh, Laurel Hill in Philadelphia. About 1836, and Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, Seattle. So we know by the time that Virginia was about 10, that uh, they had moved here to 136 Street, and her father had been married. Um, so she was living here from about the time she was 10, from the 1850 census. We think that Erasmus Tompkins and Euler is living there with the same with Fanny. Virginia is listed as being 13 then, and she has uh, two half sisters and half brother, and there are two Irish servants living in her as well. But soon after the next year, 1851, her father dies down in Savannah. So at this point, the census is so helpful for information about families, it's only taken every 10 years. Um, so we know soon after this that her sort of South Point chapter begins, but this is an image of Southport in 1835. Um, but we sort of have to look to other sources and do a little more digging to find out more about her and where she's living. Is she still living with her stepmother? Um, the stepmother raised her from the time she was less than a year old. So she must have thought of her like a mother. Um, but there are sort of these mysteries that we have to dig into. Um, I'll also point out here, she has a uh, strong connection to the Perry family. And then there's a, a steeple of the church in the middle of the image there, just to the right. You can see Charles Perry's house on the Road. Uh, she was close with Charles' daughter, and mm -hmm. her son, cousin, also named Eddie Perry. So they can just know a bunch of Eddie Perry's in the story. Um, but Eddie Perry was from the cousin and his second cousin was exactly the same age as her. And again, you can see the family tree there and Charles Perry. 
to focus a little bit now just on Frederick and his mother, Penny, um, Frederick's wife. They were married, they were uh, first cousins, um, but they were married and we have a little bit of detail about their marriage from the journals of Jonathan Bulkley, which are an amazing resource we have here at Cape Library. This is where Penny and Frederick would have lived uh, beginning in 1832. They were married in 22, about 10 years later. They built a house that was on our front lawn there. And Penny's brother, Francis Perry, built the house the same year, um, the house just next door that's still standing there. Her other brother, Henry, built a similar house, same year, 1832, down in West Bay Road, um, almost near the water. And then Charles, his house on Harborview, we saw earlier, it was built a bit. This is just a page from the Jonathan Goldie Journals. Um, amazing resource. He just talks about sort of all of the gossip of town. Um, there's an entry here. Uh, Monday the 20th, nothing in particular except a great party from the Marquons this evening from 50 to 60 in all and nearly all South Four people without distinction of age, religion, or politics. So again, this journal was really helpful when figuring out where Virginia lived when and how long she stayed in Brooklyn um, before she came to prison. So the first time she appears in a journal is at the very end of 1852. She would have been 15, and Uncle Frederick takes her and some others to a lecture by a very famous sort of celebrity lecturer about timbers. August uh, later that year, they go to Saratoga Springs. And in November, they go to St. Augustine, Florida for the winter. <clears throat> so, you know, it's pretty clear uh, by uh, August, when she is 16, that she is living in the South. Looking at another resource now, um, this is an amazing scrapbook that Frederick has that is at the Center for Brooklyn History in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, it's an amazing book of uh, train tickets, um, calling cards, little specimen of the scene from St. Augustine. It's, uh, it's a wonderful thing. And just like the Jonathan Bolton Journals, um, it has so much information that helps us sort of weave this story on uh, Virginia and Mark Hospital. So they spent about six months in St. Augustine. And then by 1855, um, we can look at both the journals and the scrapbook to learn more about uh, this year long trip they took to Europe. And it is actually Jonathan is mourning his, his wife who he lost the previous year. Um, but he got to know how Frederick's wife and Mark Hans had been sick at that time as well, which is another piece of information that we didn't have before. Um, apparently, in the 1840s, she was so sick it wasn't thought that she would live. But now, 10 years later, when she is setting, setting out on a trip to Europe, the passport that they used for that trip is on the table in the back if you haven't seen it. Um, this describes who uh, who took that trip. It was Frederick, his wife Penny, Virginia, and uh, at that point, uh, Henry, who was on this way, he had driving his widow during his trip to Europe as well. In his scrapbook, 
Frederick kept the calling cards, the announcement about when the passengers set sail. And in the lower left there, you can see a calling card for Edward Sheffield Bartholomew. So this was a Connecticut born sculptor who worked in Italy. And while they were there, they had their busts done by, um, sculpted by Mr. Bob Bartholomew. In addition, the bas reliefs that are on the wall over to your right, um, Bartholomew did those at that time as well. Okay, Virginia was 18 at this time. And the bus, as some of you probably know, is in the Renault building just off the way. Another wonderful resource I came across was a published journal diary from a little girl who was eight years old and met up with the Marcon family when they were traveling in Italy. Uh, here she talks about going to the mass ball. We called the hotel on the chair for Virginia Monk Barton. She seemed to came out and stepped into the carriage. She looked sweetly. Her hair was turned over in the front in a broad band, and she had a dress of a green and white rose glass hanging down, covering the front of her head. She had a beautiful pearl dress pin and earrings and white gloves with a beautiful pink. And one of the details I love as well. In the scrapbook, Frederick pasted a picture of that hotel and circled its little window on the upper left and said, FM's room in 1856. There's also a description in uh, the little girl's journal about Arnold in Rome. He says, Oh, I never had such fun in my life as yesterday. And again, she was eight years old. She was like, so uh, there was an enormous, uh, enormous box in the room filled with confetti. We threw down little bouquets to persons in the street, and they saw them all beside them, stopping on with a dignified and contemptuous look, seeing our little bouquets, and I was stooping to pick them up. And this made us so angry that we took handfuls of confetti from our handkerchiefs and held to them until they were obliged to go into the balconies for shelter. Carriages were passed, filled with gentlemen. Virginia kept watching the balcony to see if there were any, and when she saw one, she would explain, Come girls, now we have a pelting. Here's a half of a chance. And then shadows of the bed came down upon her face. Some of the bouquets, uh, the, the gentleman would throw the bouquets back up at them. Some of the bouquets went too hard and fell on the balcony. A furious hailstorm came, however, to make up these. Couple other items from the scrapbook. Um, we have a receipt from their stay in the hotel on the chair. Uh, just a notice that I love not about you, but about how the great wonder of the age, the monster crown, measuring 12 feet and 40 pounds. And Frederick has written a little note that Frederick saw in San Francisco. <laughs> Uh, and then also, there is a notice from the Paris Exposition. Exposition. In the upper right, there was a sort of tethered balloon that people could rise up in, and there's a note written about the balloon that um, in Frederick's hand that says that M in Virginia that they wanted to pull in. So, jumping ahead a little bit, uh, this is. Virginia and Elbert Pembroke. They married in 1872. She was 35. And Elbert was actually a widower of that second cousin, her good friend, Eddie Perry, um, who had married him a few years earlier and died childless. So they were married a few years after that. And had their first child, Frederick Marcon's twin brother, when she was 38. There's a family portrait on the left of Frederick Albert 
Bridge India and uh, Little Frederick Monroe. In the center is Virginia and Pleasant and Frederick, and on the right, a picture of Pleasant Frederick. On the back of this photograph, you notice that the photograph was taken for Virginia for her birthday, and it says something to the effect of our little telegraph messenger. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but apparently, uh, in fact, maybe lots of young boys were riding bicycles to deliver telegraphs. So perhaps they had those. Rain. Uh, Sadly, when he was just five years old, he passed away from laryngitis with her. And this sort of makes an expert to talking about their philanthropic efforts. Um, one discovery I made was their first match into the Hanson Institute in Virginia. This is now the Hanson University, a historically black research university. And, uh, pardon me, Ober was a trustee and president for a time. And after their child's death, they made a uh, gift for two annual scholarships, the Frederick Marquand and Rose Permanent Scholarship in memory of their beloved and only child. They also donated the first gymnasium, a greenhouse, the treasurer's office, and a handsome memorial child, which is on the right. And this was clearly an important institution for them. They continued to donate to it, um, both Frederick, his daughter Virginia, and Robert. One of the best known alums of uh, the Hampton Institute is Booker T. Washington. He went on to become the first principal of the Tuskegee Institute. And they donated to Tuskegee as well. Uh, we know that Booker T. Washington came to Southport early in the institution's history and met the family here then. Uh, they all, Albert, Virginia, and Frederick, made small donations. And in Booker T. Washington's autobiography, he says that. Uh, that Albert, sorry, it's Albert, made the $500 donation, which came as a surprise um, because they didn't think anybody would remember them. Frederick dies in 1882, and Virginia, his adopted daughter, is his only heir. He's, his entire estate is to her. But he does make other requests as well. And again, what was interesting to me was uh, that so many of them, because we do know about the gifts to, um, to Yale, for instance, um, but a lot of them were to smaller institutions that uh, offer education to people of color. Um, and similarly, we see recognized uh, Mary Ann Johnson of Fairfield and Aurelia Burr. Um, those were uh, two people, two workers who lived at the house here for many years, or really up for decades, um, probably previously enslaved by the Burr family. Uh, they were uh, both women of color. And the monument there on the right is for Aurelia and for the Mark Horns coachman, which I suspect uh, the, the, the monument was paid for by the Mark Horn family. He also, Frederick, gave money to the Colored Home in St. Augustine, where they clearly had a connection with Bill Granger. And again, he left more money to the government in school in Virginia.
And of course, he left a large legacy to Virginia and a few other heirs um, for the cause of education, spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ, encouraging dating, any good work even in our country for the foreign lands. And Virginia took that message and founded the Law Library. So if I was there on the line, some of you can be familiar with this. The house still standing on the front lawn and the library under construction in the back. Virginia left Southport eventually for Terrytown. This is from the new tax Terrytown. He passed away in 1826. And again, just looking at some of her requests, a lot of them are to institutions that are considered historically Black research universities. The Thea College was the first that's mentioned on the upper left, I'm sorry, Berea College, uh, the first Southern US college to be both co educationally integrated. Lincoln Institute is um, Lincoln University in Pennsylvania. Additional money to the Hampton Institute and to several other um, schools in Alabama. So again, she left money to lots of places. The family left large legacies to to Yale, to the YMCA. But this was really a surprise to me. Um, was just how much money was devoted to underserved populations. And I think when we think about her devotion to education and how she interpreted Frederick's message to use his legacy for education, it just gives me another context to understand that through the donation section. And with that, back to the beginning uh, with my favorite image of her journey here in her older years at Terry Town. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. The image of all her contributions to education, which is not such a common education for these elements. The question was, uh, did she herself attend any schools? And that is what I still don't have an answer to. I now know that she came from the history style for her growth and when she was about 16. So that might have been sort of a event for doing that in about age 16. Um, I haven't found much any mention of her in newspapers and graduation lists. Um, and obvious choice for school, originally I thought might be the Packer Institute, which was a girls' school in Brooklyn. Uh, but I can find evidence that she was there. Um, in Frederick's scrapbooks, he does have information about where his wife went to school, which was in, I think it was maybe called a Moravian school in Pennsylvania, um, where other girls that about Virginia's age, where they went to school. Um, one was in Troy, one was in New Hampshire, Lebanon, New Hampshire. Um, no mention of Virginia where she went to school, so I think that's still a mystery. Um, did you find any evidence that at what point she started going back in Virginia? Early in her life, she goes by Mary. Um, and it seems like in about her teenage years, sometimes you see her referred to as Mary Virginia, but mostly becomes Virginia. And the other question I, uh, I wanted to find the answer to was when she started using Mark Bonds, mm -hmm. um, because that was her mother's maiden name, but it wasn't clear if that was originally part of her name. Um, it does seem like later in life she sort of she got that whole full name, Mary Virginia Hopkins, then Mark Lyman. 
So yeah, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how we can start to apply what we want now is the special collection of the lot carries where it looks and I'm seeing in particular of the full speaker when you mentioned the family's support of other sort of communities and and not just the very interesting I didn't know that so the city asked about how the special collections here were developed and I guess we have like the homes as well as meet me uh, how they were acquired we have these three, I think, these four copies of Plus Weekly. Um, the collections were developed by, they were acquired by Virginia, by Alberts, um, who clearly has a big donor, Hampton University, Hampton Institute, um, had similar ideas, one went to sport. Um, they were acquired through various means. Um, I'm not sure the exact place that they acquired the post week, but another type of material in special collections that certainly came to mind for me when I was learning all this was um, all of the pamphlets and the more sort of rare ephemera we have. Um, I was familiar early on with all of the pamphlets from the Colonization Society. Um, that was the group that raise money to send formerly enslaved people to Liberia. Um, but that has sort of a, a mixed history um, because there were people who believed that formerly enslaved people would just never be able to integrate here. Um, so it's not always the abolitionists didn't necessarily support the, the colonization society. But what I've come to find as well as um, a lot more from sort of the, the more, I don't want to say radical, but some uh, radical abolitionists that we have material pamphlets from, from them as well. Um, so clearly some of that was just because Albert and Virginia supported those, um, those undertakings. Yes, I mean, the picture of the bar, um, yeah. is that local? I mean, it's a lot of the The Burr Monument, uh, Charlie took me on a great tour of local cemeteries yesterday, and we were looking for, or earlier this week, we were looking for that one. It um, is in the one cemetery we need to go to, which is the one um, <laughs> on the uh, sort of the center. It's not, it's not in the cemetery, it's not in the cemetery, it's not in the it's kind of near, uh... I think it must be the Old West, is it like it's Old West? Yeah. Okay, so you have many of the lines in the Old West, and you have the Old West, the Old West, and 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 the Old West, I'm just curious because I, I've been involved in a lot of centers and I've never seen that. Interesting. I think, um, so, yeah. I blacked out the background in that image, but um, it's from Find a Grave. And mm -hmm. in the background, you can see houses. So I suspect it is an old west. Currently, and um, but I think I'm going to be wrong. I hope to still find it and see it in person. Yes. In the announcement that he was uh, going to have there about their trip and he was on it, was it custom to include the label that was about it? Next to the name, they had her name to the doctor. I think that what you're referring to might have come from Jonathan Volpe's journal. Okay. The question was, it was a custom to 
include the word adopted. Um, and I have to say that I took those descriptions of the journal from transcriptions of Jonathan Wilkley's journal that we have. The original is currently at the Northeast Document Conservation Center. We were having it evaluated. Uh, we would love to see it conserved. Um, but I had the same question. I saw that and thought it seems unusual that the that Jonathan Wilkley would have written adopted, but I wasn't able to go to the original to see if that was in his hand or if the transcriber had enough for clarity. Okay. That stuck out to me as well. I also jumped into the thought at the age of 35, that was quite unusual for a woman in her social circle. So that I wondered what her not if if one if I'm reading it correctly, if you're reading it correctly, it says that I mean, it is somewhat limited her social standing in the community as to why she was married almost 15 years after most of That's an interesting question for our social standing. I, I don't think so. Um, most accounts of her just talk about her, her charm and what, um, what a lovely person she was. Um, Jonathan Wilkley's journals are, they're a bit off speak, so it might be a lot of people. And then she became quite the model of the community. So, you know, kind of back to a woman of just the right age. <laughs> yeah, she was. Uh, she was quite a bit older, and it was an interesting her, um, her choice. Of Albert um, being a lord of her second cousin and sort of her best friends. Um, but Albert would have also been uh, a colleague of her father and, um, and her uncle. So they must have known each other, mm -hmm. I think, from a later time. Okay. <laughs> The, it's it's true. Um, I wonder if her really liked the her mother. She did. I saw in her will. Um, she left some money to her her half siblings. Uh, so she must have had some relationship with them. Um, it was a little money. I don't think she was very close with them. <laughs> but um, maybe it was a difficult upbringing that had nothing to do with it. Also, Frederick's wife, Heidi, died not long that after that trip to Europe. And after that, uh, Virginia and Uncle Frederick were really a close pair. So they chose companions and they traveled the world together, uh, seeing monster traps and, and, um, <laughs> and writing those several things. She also had a um, lot of. Independent wealth, she had her own means, and I've seen sort of anecdotally that um, women often often marry without necessity, and if they didn't need to, if they had their own money, they often just want to. It's not an awful He was not terribly older than her, I remember correctly. I think he's really looking like her. Both her, oh. her second cousin, who seems to be close to my neighbors. So, yeah. Do you have any family advisors that Virginia wrote letters? No, I wish. And Stephanie and I talked about that. I know that even before I arrived a year ago, uh, there had been a request to find any if it existed. Um, and so far, I don't know. And then I remember the family, um, the presentation, uh, where they all came back to 
Yes. Um, was it a wish that they call from um, the lower to the lower to make way for the library? Was it her wish that the home be demolished? Um, I did recently find, I think, a newspaper notice. I'm forgetting a little bit. I know the second thing I looked at this, that they were hoping to actually find a buyer who would remove the fence. And I assume that didn't happen because I always have heard that it, it was demolished. Um, I, that's all I know. I, I think it must have been her wish that it not be in front of the library anymore. The library was sort of built in secret behind the house. And then after it was completed, the original mention was either moved, hopefully, and you will discover that it's been moved up somewhere. Um, or perhaps it was it was demolished. We also know that the house could have been place with a lot of sort of sad memories for Virginia. Um, she lost her little boy there, her son died. Um, her husband died the year the library opens, but it's within months of the library's opening. Um, and she left not long after her Terry Brown. So perhaps it just wasn't that she wasn't really anymore. Do we know who connected with was? I know that uh, there are a lot of connections in the family history to that area a lot with her path. Mark Moss has connections to that. But that doesn't have to be in there. But it doesn't seem like it was really new or important. <laughs> The actual excavation on the front lawn here by part of the man in that mansion or part of every day you spend some sort of dinner where the people meet? That's a great question. There was, was there an excavation related to the uh, swamp? The deep on swamp lake? Why would there be a lot of videos? That means there was some digging done that we made four or five years ago. Archaeologists. Um, here in some court and started back to this um, project searching for um, yes, medical. Not, not. And also, I wondered, I saw the, what we often call a sandbar map or a hospital map that shows sort of where building footprints are. Um, that in the our corner of the property back there, so we were going to have the shipping containers. It looked like there was a barn back there. And there's also a mention in, in uh, news about constructing the library. Uh, another structure was torn, torn down. I wanted to go sort of over to the corner to see if there's any evidence of a building having been there in the past. But, um, I don't think it's going to have somebody with a metal detector. Any other questions? Thank you all so much. We well, didn't have a chance to look at the items on the walls that are going back to the